What did you think of the variety cover? What did you think of that cover? <laughs> uh, we will get on to the subject of the variety cover a bit later on in the broadcast, but I, I couldn't help myself but be reminded of those very majestic, beautiful images of the Kayan women that wear all those gold hoops on the neck. I thought, is she aiming for that? Are we going to see her add one hoop at a time? It reminded, of, reminded me of Hoopla at the fun fair, you know, chuck on a hoop, see where it lands. Maybe she wants to elongate that neck, my dear, to become a little more elegant. Who knows? I think that's really key. I think that's really key. I think that's really key. And you'd think that the Harkles would issue a lawsuit against Sunshine Sachs because all those years of working with old Sunshine, and it seems to have brought nothing but rain, doesn't it? Because it's, oh, you couldn't make it up when you see the prep. Every time they do something, every utterance, there's this pushback from the press of disbelief, of scorn, and to be honest, mockery. It's become mockery, and I'm afraid that it's their own fault. They've got no one to blame but themselves. And their only option, as I indicated a few months ago, because I saw this coming round the corner, their only option and their new strategy is just to embrace the mockery. How humiliating. How utterly humiliating. I'd been looking forward to seeing what the Prince and Princess of Wales have been up to this week. But if you didn't know, they are spending time with the kids because the children are on their half-term holidays from Lambrook. But there was some really delicious footage of their majesties at the Project Zero in Walthamstow. Very lively affair with children, children, children greeting them in joy. And they looked genuinely happy to see their king and his consort. Uh, one of them, very cheeky, very cheeky young lady, asked the king his age. And as usual, their majesties were attentive, convivial, and full of tireless duty. And at the end, one sweet girl very kindly presented a bouquet to Her Majesty Camilla, as well she should. I was a little bit disappointed that the girl didn't curtsy. Uh, I blame the parents. They should be coached into that. I realise it's optional, but presentation of flowers or a formal greeting of any kind in the presence of Her Majesty without a curtsy is like a sentence without a full stop. Come on, parents out there. Get your kids a bobbing. Get them bobbing, my dear. For Queen Camilla and also to prepare them for Queen Catherine. We don't want to lose that tradition. Briefcase girls have been the talk of the day. Keeps reminding me of that Tori Amos ditty, you know, never was a cornflake girl. Well, Megan never was a briefcase girl. She was forced into it, wasn't she? <laughs> no one's buying it. <laughs> no one's buying it, not Meg. <laughs> it's rather satisfying, isn't it, my loves? They've been coming out of the woodwork to rebuke her, to rebuke her in the name of Jesus. It's lucky that the Harkles are so keen on calling out misinformation and disinformation, isn't it? Because that's what everybody seems to be doing with everything they put out there. Rebuked, rebuked. In the name of Jesus, I tell you. There was no bra station, says briefcase number nine. Nutmeg, I think, was 24. Well, number nine came forward. Is Patricia Gal. She's formally rejected this assertion that the briefcase girls had their bras padded in little booths. She said, it's unfortunate that Megan felt that way because I never felt that way. She said, she never had that negative experience. Nothing but positive memory, she says. And I think it's the same for Megan. We know that she's reimagined it, reimagined it now. And we know that when she was sitting in the motorcade with the secretary of the Argentinian treasury or whoever it was, we know that then it crossed her mind how she'd been objectified. But at the time, my good Lord, you know that she was really enjoying it. As Megan Kelly said, Megan Kelly said, she loved every moment of it. And she's right. You can see the joy in her expression. And you know why it's real? Because Megan's acting ain't that good, is it? But almost every promo photo for this, 
the joy and that smile that she has, the elation, as she trots about in her tinsel-lined mini skirts, this, that, and the third, and nothing wrong with that. I'm not disparaging her for doing that. I do it myself, given the opportunity. So, no disparagement at all, my love. But the joy, unbridled joy. That was the best gig she ever had. I bet she enjoyed it more than all the other ones put together, including her role as the Duchess of Sussex. Absolutely in her element. And Claudia Jordan, another briefcase gal, came forward. Now she's in New Housewives of Atlanta, apparently. That could have been a great vehicle for Meghan, couldn't it? Housewives of Montecito or Housewives of Frogmore. Maybe that's what we've coming, got coming up on Netflix. Housewives of Hope Branch. Netflix have begun to backtrack with regards to the crowd. And isn't this very interesting, kind of satisfying, but a little bit little too late, isn't it? This series five of The Crown, did you see they've, they've released a trailer of it? We've always known that it's fictionalised, but they seem to be taking it to new lengths taking even more liberties, which is really stupid because the people involved in the crown now are all living. You know, lots of these characters live and breathe and can testify as to what is and what isn't true. And as we've seen, Sir John Major, our former Prime Minister, has come forward to publicly criticise Netflix, as has Dame Judy, Judy, the Dench. Powerful figures coming forward. Maybe they were a bit scared to beforehand, but they've come forward and they want to defend our king. And it's really nice to see. They've added a disclaimer. It says, inspired by real events, this fictional dramatization tells the story of Queen Elizabeth II and the political and personal events that shaped her reign. John Major was acutely critical of the storylines coming up involving supposed conversations, conversations between him and Charles rather, that were disparaging of the Queen. And it blows my mind that they do this because it takes away from the enjoyment. You know, one can suspend a certain amount of disbelief for some artistic license. When you hear this kind of thing and you know that it's just completely and utterly imagined, it ruins the drama, doesn't it? Because you can't get into it is not only stupid and disappointing, but it's also unnecessary because all the drama was there with the facts. All you have to do is hook the script onto things that actually happened and you still would have had a really great show. So it's disappointing all around, really. And it certainly appears to me that the reason they've decided to do it now, just before the fifth season, four have already gone by and we've only got two more to go. So why are they doing it now? Because They've seen the reaction to the Queen's death. They've seen that no, monarchy isn't dead. No, the kingdom don't hate their royal family. They're absolutely beloved. And even, surprise, surprise, you're expecting the big baddie to come along in the shape of Charles. And for everything to instantly crumble. Well, no. No, he's suddenly become the backbone of this country because he was so well prepared by the Queen and by his own volition. Very well prepared to take on the duty and guess what? What's going on within our government and the running of this country is a disgrace at the moment. I intimated only last week that Liz Truss might not even make her second Prime Minister's audience with the King. Well, it looks like she's just scraped in with a second. Will she get round to her third next week? I'm not sure. But as of yesterday, as you may know, she resigned uh, and she becomes the shortest serving Prime Minister in the history of this nation. And it's a very worrying time here. There is so much turmoil. And I've already seen some calls in the press for the King to dissolve government, <laughs> which would be a very drastic step, very unlikely. Some people think that the King or the monarch does not have those powers, but actually, yes, 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 he does. There are safety valves hidden deep in the constitution for emergency use only. The first of those powers is to dismiss the government, as happened in 1834, when King William IV dismissed the Whig administration under Lord Melbourne. So it's been a while, but it can be done. And the second kind of power is to dissolve 
the government, his majesty's government entirely, against the advice of the prime minister. And the last time that happened was not quite so long ago, 1910. But it's one of the reasons, and I know it's not to everybody's taste, but it's one of the reasons that I prefer and enjoy being subject to a monarch. Because I like to know that the buck doesn't stop with those at the top of that pyramid of governmental power, political power. No, it goes beyond to an institution that is above politics, non-partisan, and is there to serve the people throughout their life, not just for a few years. That gives me great comfort, and it is giving me comfort in this week, month, year, few years of extreme turmoil, politically and governmentally speaking, and internationally speaking, with matters outside of one's hands with regards to the pandemic. And as you may have garnered from the way I speak about this kingdom, it's a kingdom that, I'm, that I've always been very proud of and that I do believe and have always believed is a great nation. But at this moment in time, no, I don't feel proud of it. At this moment in time, one of the things that I am clinging on to and that I do remain extremely proud of is our monarchy and our royal way of life. And if King Charles wasn't there heading up an institution that is something to be truly cherished, truly the jewel in our crown as a subject, I would just say, well, let the whole thing go to the dogs, my dear. Let it all go to the dogs. What, what is there left to be proud of? So it's at times like this when I believe the people of this nation, of all stripes, will continue to look to monarchy. A steady hand above the calamity and the din. Judy Dench even wrote into the Times, who published her letter regarding this crown affair. Sir John Major is not alone in his concerns that the latest series of the crown will present an inaccurate and hurtful account of history. Indeed, the closer the drama comes to our present times, the more freely it seems willing to blur the lines between historical accuracy and crude sensationalism. While many will recognise the crown for the brilliant but fictionalised account of events that it is, I fear that a significant number of viewers, particularly overseas, may take its version of history as being wholly true. Given some of the wounding suggestions apparently contained in the new series, that King Charles plotted for his mother to abdicate, for example, or once suggested his mother's parenting, was so deficient that she might have deserved a jail sentence, this was both cruelly unjust to the individuals and damaging to the institution they represent. No one's a greater believer in artistic freedom than I, but this cannot go unchallenged, despite this week stating publicly that The Crown has always been a fictionalised drama. The programme makers have resisted all calls for them to carry a disclaimer at the start of each episode. The time has come for Netflix to reconsider, for the sake of a family and a nation so recently bereaved as a mark of respect to a sovereign who served her people so dutifully for 70 years, and to preserve its reputation in the eyes of British subscribers. Dame Judi Dench, London W. Well, it's not enough to just say it's based on true events and hope that that does the trick. No, it's absolutely disgusting that they've gotten away with this for four years or however many years it is for the, the previous four seasons. It's disgusting, and it's only right that they're making some sort of small amends for it now. It's not enough to say, based on past events. No, you lay it down that it is fictionalised drama, as you have just done at last. Watch out, guys, because, you know, my wife's an executive, and she's going to tell you what's key. And she's been telling people again this week what's key. Key, 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 key. Oh, and I've noticed one of their other f phrases that keeps popping up, I think, in two of her recent podcasts and the interview as well. She talks about the North Star, as in her guiding star, that thing that you follow that leads you to your destination, your destiny. That's a North Star for me. What's your North, North Star? That's the new thing. They love their little sound bites, don't they? I suppose I can't accuse others of that, and I'm a bit guilty of doing it myself. But 
it's the ones you pick isn't it it's the ones you choose and they choose really basic ones and as chief impact officer we've got a man of real importance here chief impact officer a veteran he's the chief he joined the CEO of Better Up on stage for a chin wag, and it was word salad. And the word of the day, the phrase of the day was scale, scale. It's all about scaling up. And the chief impact officer was very, very clear. If you're going to scale your company, the only way I believe you can do that is to successfully scale yourself and scale your employees at the same time. So you've got to scale. You know, when you're dealing with scale and something on a grand scale, you've got to scale up. You've got to start with scaling yourself and then scale your employees. More scales than a mermaid's tail. Well, the word salad was totally off the scale. And to the subject of Variety magazine. Variety is the spice of life. And apparently the spice of the moment is nutmeg. The Megan moment they call it. No, no variety. <laughs> My dears. The Megan moment was in 2018. When she got that hubby to sign on the dotted line. That was her moment. We'll give it to her. Ever since then. <laughs> Don't pee on my leg, my dear. And the photographs that accompany this piece are really quite hilarious. I can only imagine the briefing, the thought shower that they might have had before doing. I want to look playful. I want to look fun abstract and edgy and you know you always get the feeling that she's someone pretending to be a model you ain't a model meg you're a housewife on stilts the article has the temerity to begin with the duchess of sussex is in mourning <laughs> i ask you her new career is professional troll and she knows it all she can do now is troll and she that could be very lucrative for her it could be very, very lucrative for her. Don't dismiss it in that respect. It tells us that when Megan arrived for her interview with Variety, she arrived in a golf buggy. She was in a golf cart moving around from place to place. And she passed a group of 60 year old women who had been celebrating a landmark birthday in the area. And they were all shocked apparently to see Megan there. And you know, she was passing by in the golf buggy and it brought back memories of the motorcade with the Argentinian Secretary of the Treasury. So her, her desk comisados were there for her to see. And she greeted them and she waved at them. And it says that these women were beside themselves because they're in the company of an American woman who had met and married a handsome young prince. Handsome young prince. Well, one out of three ain't bad, is it, my dears? The writer offers Megan to us as a nerdy mum. She says she's a nerdy mum in her private life. She plays Jeopardy. She plays Wordle in bed. That must be fun. With a naughty glass of wine. And her favourite song is Cozy by Beyonce. Oi! Oi! Cozy belongs to King Charles. King Cozy socks. King Cozy socks. Oh, King Cozy socks. Don't you start taking his word. And don't hijack that song either, because I'm quite, I'm quite partial to that song myself. It's about being cosy in one's skin. But she's just name dropping it because she can't keep Beyonce or Jay-Z's name out of her mouth, can she? Her idol, her queen. You ain't down with the kids, Meg. And it has to be said that the writer says that she is incredibly easy with the crew. She's delightful. She's a pleasure to be around. She's forthcoming. She's not guarded. It's nothing like the, the image that's been painted of her. And she asks Megan what she wants out of life. What's a Joy, she says. Joy, I want joyfulness. Joy, joy, joy. It's like she's channeling Abraham Hicks. And it says that Megan had been all set before Queen Elizabeth died to be honoured at Variety's 2022 Class of Power of Women. Oh, honestly. To be fated for her philanthropic and creative work. Are you kidding me? Creative work. Archetypes. I, I just, I haven't got words for that. 
and philanthropic. Okay, Archwell are doing some good deeds, I'm sure. So they tell us. Now, isn't it a bit premature, my dears? All these awards, all these adulations from various quarters. Have they been running a year and a half, haven't they? One year, two years? Normally, you want to see someone with a real established model who have been devoting themselves to service for years before they get these kind of accolades. But seems premature to me. Now, there was another photo which I'm afraid I, it is too vulgar for me to describe what I actually saw when I first viewed it. So I'm not going to go there because it's incredibly vulgar. But as you can see, it looks like some kind of tie-dye accident of some kind of discarded stained rag. And she's either standing in a parachute or a collapsed tent or some other bodily membrane of your choice. No idea what the hell she's doing there, to be honest. She had the gall to speak on the legacy of Queen Elizabeth. And she's got nothing but praise now. Now she's six foot under, nothing but praise. Certainly, in terms of female leadership, she is the most shining example of what that looks like. No. No, Megan. Well, yes, you're right, she is. The words are true, but she's more than that. She's not just a feminist icon, although she is one, or could be perceived that way. You don't have to speak about her in terms of female leadership. She's just a leader. Don't you understand? You're the one that throws these things into the mix which displays your own prejudice, your own, your own warped view of the world. But she was above that. She was just a leader. You don't have to categorize her as a female one. In this context, I feel deep gratitude to have been able to spend time with her and get to know her. Well, you really showed your gratitude for that, didn't you? By damaging her 70 year reign and reputation and the Commonwealth, with all the countries of the Commonwealth now clamoring to rid themselves of their head of state because of what you and Hubby did. Another photo gives the impression she's standing on tiptoe, wearing some kind of napkin affair, some napkin from an office function, turned down at the corners, with pale blue toilet tissue being wafted behind her in some sort of arrangement. She actually looks much lovely in a trailer that accompanied this piece, which is extraordinarily cringe, almost humorous because it is so bad, but she looks much nicer there. You know, she really can be a very attractive girl. I know some of you find that hard to swallow, but she can look really, really nice with the right team and with the right lighting. And she came over much nicer physically in that moving image, these moving pictures than she did. I mean, that cover photo, I don't think was flattering at all. The lighting, the airbrushing wasn't really working, but she divulges some secret information in the trailer. She says, I play a mean game of Scrabble. <laughs> and she's so conspiratorial about it. Ooh, you naughty girl. Naughty girl. She's like Theresa May, isn't she? What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? Running through a field of wheat to escape the local vicar. It's a similar kind of thing. These girls, you know, too pure to be pink, I ask you. And I love to cook, she says. I don't know if a lot of people knew that. Why would they and why would they care? So self-aggrandizing. I don't know if a lot of people knew that. Maybe they do. I also make a really solid bolognese sauce. How complex. You're gonna open up some kind of Michelin star restaurant. I wouldn't be surprised if she's angling for some kind of cookbook. That might be one of her new tomes published by Random Penguins. We'll see. And another one of her stupid key phrases, a high tide raises all ships. Why does everything have to be some kind of poetic allegory with this girl? <laughs> I just know. I knew when I saw this, some of you would think of me and get the giggles because she comes out with it, doesn't she? I'm sure she's been watching the broadcast. I think that's really key. I think that's really key. I think that's really key. You know what's really key? This is really key. 
I also had a giggle when she trotted out her affection for when Harry met Sally, because it was only a couple of weeks ago when I drew the comparison to when Harry met Sally, if you remember. And I don't know if she's ever mentioned this before, but honestly, honestly, I had no idea it was her favourite movie. So that made me chuckle as well. And on the subject of archetypes, very profound stuff. And she says, we dig deeper than a lot of us have been allowed to before. About as deep as a puddle. And I'm sorry, what's all this deeper than we've, a lot of us have been allowed to before? You're saying that you are the one that's giving people permission to discuss these things, whereas no one has before. You're taking them to a place in archetypes where young women have never been able to discuss these things before. With regards to Queen Elizabeth, she says, I've reflected on that first official engagement that I had with her, how special that felt. I feel fortunate and I continue to be proud to have had a nice warmth with the matriarch of the family. Apparently they feel really energised right now and excited about all of the things that they've been building toward. We're also focused on our foundation. Just like the Foundation Eva Perón, the spiritual leader of Argentina. But just like her role model Evita, she's got her own Foundation. So much of the work we do includes the philanthropic space. Yeah. Philanthropizing yourselves among all the other recipients, aren't you, my lover? And this is where the writer tried to get her to spill tea. You've done two major interviews since returning to America, one with Oprah, one with New York Magazine, which some found to be snarky. Oh, yes, they actually went there. What's it been like to open up about your life now? That story was intended to support archetypes and focus on our projects. I've had some time to reflect on it. Part of me is just really trusting, really open. That's how I move in the world. I have to remember that I don't ever want to become so jaded that that piece of me goes away. So despite any of those things, onward, I can survive it. Oh, she's Teflon, isn't she? She thinks she's just so darn tough. Yet again, she tells us that she wasn't the pretty one. She was the smart one. No, you weren't. We've been there. We've done this, Megan, several times. You weren't either, and that's fine. Would you ever consider going back to acting? Megan is asked. No, I'm done. You're done? Or were you done for? Was the industry done with you? No, I'm done, she says. I guess never say never. Please, please say never. But my intention is to absolutely not. Well, she won't be acting on the screen. Unless it's a chat show screen under the auspices of Oprah or Gail, Jerry Springer, Jeremy Kyle. Take your pick. Oh, but she'll still be acting. Don't you worry, my dears. It just won't be the professional kind. And there was lashings and lashings and lashings more of this word salad, but I can't stomach reading any more of it out, apart from to say that we're told Harry's favourite place to hang out is the in and out They're friends with all the people there at the drive through it's really fun to go through the drive through she says, and surprise them. They know our order. Well, you can certainly see why they spend so much time and effort rustling up some kind of interesting portraiture for the press to talk about, can't you? Because she has nothing interesting to say, ever. And it's always as if she's addressing a classroom of five-year-old children. And with that said, I thank you very much for joining me in the broadcast today. I'd love you to leave me a nice juicy comment. I've been going through them voraciously recently, trying to catch up on all of them, and they delight me. And if you'd like to treat me to a cup of tea or a slice of cake, my tip jar is in the description box. And I thank you most sincerely. I'll see you next time.